Constantine, a Hellblazer podcast. Everybody and welcome back. Before we get into the episode, just want to let you know that this is the free version of the podcast, and all that means is that we are way behind where I'm at in Patreon. So if you are loving this podcast and you need more John Constantine in your life, definitely go check us out at patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books and sign up for the Hellblazer tier, where you'll get access to the entire Hellblazer library that I've recorded so far, and also you'll get access to the exclusive episodes of the Planes, Trains, and Comic Books main podcast. So if any of that sounds good to you, definitely go over to patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books, all one word, and sign up there. And with that out of the way, let's get into the issue. Today, we are doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be reading parts of issue 70 and then issue 71 completely. And that's because issue 70 doesn't really have anything to do with John Constantine necessarily. It actually takes place in Ireland with Kit, and we see her returning to her family and just hanging out with them. So most of it's kind of just like a family reunion where you get to understand her character a little bit more, but there's nothing really about the story that progresses other than a couple pages. So I'm gonna read those couple pages and I'll set it up and everything so you know what's going on. But that's why we're doing it like this and I'm kind of skipping through 70. And just a little catch up in case you don't remember, in the last couple issues, John has been homeless living on the streets because him and Kit have broken up And also John's best friend Chaz has left him hanging as well. But of course, it's always John's fault. Like he actually was the one who caused all these problems. So because of this, he's been living on the streets, all depressed all the time, just trying to stay drunk. And we saw in issue 69 that he basically had a death wish. He was waiting for the king of the vampires to bite him and kill him. But fate intervened and John's demon blood actually saved his life. And John was able to kill the king of the vampires. And then he just went back to being his mopey self. So first things first, with issue 70, we got the cover. We see Kit is sitting in a chair in front of a window in a pretty sparsely furnitured house. And she's got an alcoholic drink in her hand as she stares out the window and thinks. And then we see behind her is a ghostly shadow of John Constantine hovering above her. And this issue was written by Garth Ennis with art by Steve Dillon. So like I said, this is all about Kit returning home and catching up with her family and getting drunk at a bar with them. And of course there's yelling and loving and screaming and fighting and all that stuff. And the only significant thing that happened during this whole bar talk scene was when Kit went to the bar to order, she accidentally ordered a gin and tonic because that is what John usually drinks. And then she pauses for a second when someone asks, who's that for? And then she looks all sad for a second and tells the bartender to forget that gin and tonic. So after the bar, the family splits up and Kit goes to her younger sister's house and they begin to drink some more and talk at the table And this is where she gets into stuff about John and her feelings about him. And she says to her younger sister, And I just don't know anymore. I mean, he liked me because he could relax with me, you know? He had this sort of front for everyone else. But underneath it, he was a nice fella. Or he was doing his best to be anyway. And her sister says, Did he love you? And Kit replies, He he was into all this really, really dangerous stuff. But he didn't let any of it touch me. Until that last time, anyway. And then Kit looks down at the table, very sad, and she says, But at the end, right, when I told him I was leaving, he was saying things I never thought I'd hear out of him. He stopped just short of telling me he loved me. You have no idea what that meant coming from him. And Kit pauses, just thinking for a second, and her little sister wants to hear more of the story, so she says, And? And Kit continues, Well, I... I just wouldn't listen to him. You know what I'm like. And then he called me cold and her sister interjects and you ate the head off him. And Kit looks up at her sister and they both look like they have an understanding and she thinks it's kind of funny what she just said. So Kit kind of smiles and says, hi. Then her and her sister proceed to get very, very, very drunk to the point where her sister is almost passed out of the table singing an Irish song called I'll Tell Me Ma. And this song is about uh, a woman who's dating a man named Albert Mooney and just about how she's so much in love with him. And I mention it because as her sister sings it, Kit is walking around the house and she's looking out the window. And as the song talks about being in love, she's second guessing her decision to leave. 
So as she thinks about this, she remembers John saying, you shouldn't ever take shit off anyone. And then she gets super sad and starts to cry and says, oh, John, oh, John, maybe I should have. And then she continues to cry and she walks back into the kitchen and looks at her little sister who's super drunk and singing this song. And the ending line of the song is, for it's Albert Mooney she still loves. And then still crying, Kit actually breaks a smile as she leans against the door and watches her sister. And over this panel, we get a quote from someone named Hugh Leonard that says, it was a long time before I realized that love turned upside down is love for all that. Which I guess means that if you're in love, you're in love. And even if you're having a hard time or something's going on with your relationship, if the feelings are still there, then no matter what, even if it turns bad, you still had that love for that person. Or at least that's what I got from it. Maybe I'm wrong, but, <laughs> but uh, that is how issue 70 ends. And the name of this issue is Heartland. So there's actually a one-shot issue about Kit that is way later that Steve Dillon and Garth Ennis did um, that is also called Heartland. And that is actually a prequel to this issue where you see more of her family. It's about living in Belfast during the time of the bombings and stuff with the IRA and then like British military presence being on the streets there. It's a really interesting issue if you kind of want to look at it historically like that. There's not much about Hellblazer there. It's just about Kit and her family. So if you want to check that out, it's named the same name as this issue, which is Heartland. So that wraps up issue 70. And now we got issue 71. And we start here with the cover. We see there is a dead pilot. So like a skeleton looking pilot. He's strapped into the plane still. And he's even got his skeleton hand on the yoke, I believe it's called for a plane, which is the steering wheel, if you don't know. And we see behind him is like the body of an airplane that's all scuffed up and there's like a bullseye on the side of it. And then there's a bunch of airplanes that have been stenciled in black over that. So I think that that means those are the amount of planes that this particular person has killed in this particular plane. And we see this is written by Garth Ennis with art by Steve Dillon. And we start off with John on the edge of the Thames River and he's still homeless and he's drinking and he's walking along the water edge where we can see like a bunch of trash in the grass line there's a tire and a drainage pipe, which I'm sure is letting very clean water out into the Thames River. And as John walks, the narration says, the new year's come and gone without me. Trafalgar Square was lights and crowds. And I looked down on the neck of a cheap bloody whiskey bottle where last year it was deep green eyes. And I cried my friggin' heart out. So here I am with the city far behind me, away down the river where I just keep staggering and the lights are out in heaven and smoky ice is snapping in my lungs. And I sing a song the green eyes taught me, and I remember raven hair and skin like snow at sunset. But you know, for the life of me, I can't remember her name. And then we see a very drunk John is singing a song, and this is a real song, it's called Mountains of Morn, and I'm gonna do a bit of a drunk rendition for you guys. So John sings, Oh Mary, this London's a wonderful sight There's people here working By day and by night They don't sow potatoes Nor barley or wheat But there's gangs of them digging For gold in the street And then John stumbles and almost falls right there And he catches himself in the water But he doesn't spill a drop of whatever he's drinking And he continues his song At least when I asked them, that's what I was told. So I just took a hand at this digging for gold. But for all that I found there, I might as well be. For the mountains of morn sweep down to the sea. And then John takes a big swig of whatever's in his bottle. And his narration says, I, I had this mate called Davy. And then he pauses and he throws up all over the ground. And then his narration continues as he wipes his mouth saying, he was flogging his arse and dying of AIDS, but he was a clever little bloke. He said, it's not so bad being the lowest form of friggin' life. At least it means you can't go any lower. And as John wipes the vomit from his mouth, he looks down at his hand and he sees it's not just bile and stuff in his vomit. There's some blood in it too, which is concerning. But he pushes that thought away and he sits down in the grass and as he does this, his narration says, but you know, you were wrong, Davy. There's always one place lower you can go. And then he leans back into the grass and lays down. And we see above his head, there's an arm of a skeleton, like a human skeleton. 
but he doesn't see it. He's just passed out next to it. And as he closes his eyes to fall asleep, all of a sudden he sees a little white light begin to shine in the darkness. And his narration says, what's the light? The green white dream. Where am I now? What's going on? What's going on? And as he says this last what's going on, all of a sudden we see the eyes of a pilot open up and he's got his oxygen mask on and he's got his air goggles and his plane is flying towards a town and he's about to smash into a chapel. And the pilot yells, oh my God. And his narration says, pull up, come on you bitch, up, up. And he does that so his plane barely clips the top of the spire of the chapel but he is saved. His plane is definitely smoking and looks like it's been through war. And the plane is a British World War II fighter plane called the Hurricane. And as the pilot is able to pull up and he's still in flight, he thinks, thank bloody Jesus. Oh God, that was close. And we see there's like smoke coming out of his engine and the tips of the wings are starting to fall apart on the plane. And the pilot's narration says, and good Jesus, she's a mess. Shot full of holes. Going to shed that bloody alien on. Temperature's almost off the clock. Out you bloody well go, Jamie boy. But as Jamie the pilot tries to open the cockpit hatch, he realizes, oh no. Oh, don't jam on me. Don't, don't, don't. And then he says out loud, come on, you bastard, for Christ's sake. But no matter how hard he struggles, he can't get the hatch open. So he stops doing that and he looks around and he thinks to himself, I don't even have the bloody height to bail out. I'm going to die. And as he flies past the city, you can see his plane is struggling, but it's still in the air. It's still going. And his narration continues. I'm really going to die. Jamie Kilmartin, 1922 to 1940. Never slept with a woman and two kills to his credit. R.I.P. How could I have been so stupid? They told me a million bloody times too. Watch your back. Always watch your back. And I'm closing on this Stuka without a care in the world. Forgetting everything but getting the bastard in the gun sight. And then the mirrors full of Messerschmitt and the hurry shot to bits around me. After everything old Grant said to me too. Christ, I thought he'd blown a bloody gasket. So Jamie the pilot begins to think back to him talking to this person he called old Grant. Who was apparently their squadron leader. And Grant is sitting on the ground leaning against the wheel of his plane. And he's drinking from a bottle, I'm assuming alcohol. And Jamie says to him, uh, squadron leader Grant? And Grant looks up and says, huh? And Jamie answers, Sergeant Kilmartin, sir. I was just, uh, out for a walk before turning in and well, but he's cut off by Grant as Grant finishes his sentence for him saying, you're wondering why your commanding officer is sitting pisses of fart under his aircraft. And then Grant staggers to his feet and holds out the bottle to Jamie and says, here. And Jamie says, well, I don't normally, but he's cut off again by Grant saying, Oh, in Christ's name, take it. You're Blue Flight, Nichols Wingman. And Jamie answers, yes, sir, as he takes the bottle of liquor and sniffs it. And Grant continues, he's good, Nichols. Stick to him. I come out here every night, Kilmartin. Have a good think about who didn't come back today and who won't come back tomorrow. And not a bloody thing I can do about it either. And then Jamie says, well, it's... And then he takes a swig out of the bottle really quick and goes, ah, and continues, it's something we all worry about, isn't it, sir? When old man death's going to come calling. And all of a sudden, Grant gets kind of an angry look on his face, and he says to Jamie, what? And Jamie sees his reaction and tries to backpedal, saying, I mean, well, you know what I mean, sir. It's not something that can be helped, is it? We, uh, we all know we could get it someday. You just accept it, don't you? And get on with it, sir. Sir? And right as he asks that, apparently Grant must have had a crazy look on his face, and then out of nowhere, Grant grabs him by his lapels and pushes Jamie against the aircraft and says, you stupid little bastard. And Jamie yells out, sir, for crying out loud. And Grant yells back, shut up. Do you know what you're talking about, Kilmartin? Do you? You don't accept death. You don't humanize it. And it's not your freaking friend. Old man death, listen to yourself. I've been with this squadron since France, boy. I saw 10 of my men go down on those yellow nose bastards. I saw death. It's not your friend. It's a twisted, coiled, ugly length of dog shit. And you fight it to your last bloody drop. And then he calms down for a second and he releases Jamie and slightly pushes him away. And then he proceeds to walk away from Jamie and he says, otherwise you're nothing. Otherwise, 
Why did you even bother in the first place? Then we leave the flashback and we cut back to Jamie flying his very damaged hurricane. And this is actually the day after that conversation because the narration says, and all last night and this morning, I wondered what he meant. Even when he came belting past us at breakfast screaming, scramble idiots. I was still thinking he'd gone mad. We're normally so polite to one another, aren't we? You don't want to be rude to some chap you might never see alive again. And there was Grant, calling me a bastard, cursing me up and down. But now, face to face with the end of my bloody life, I can see what he was telling me. It's simple. It's a choice. I want to live. And then we see Jamie's face turn from desperate to very stone-faced, like he's decided something. And he says out loud, All right. So it seems he's not giving up on his life just yet. So he assesses his situation, and his narration says, She's a mess, no doubt about it. But if I nurse her, take it nice and easy. It'll make Horn Church in ten minutes. The Thames will be coming into view soon. Christ, maybe the bloody undercart still works, and I won't even have to pancake. I want to see the lads again. To drink and laugh with them. To kick death down with youth and jokes and joy. To push this beautiful, beautiful bloody airplane halfway to heaven, where the sun melts gold across the sky, and the clouds are castles out of fairyland. And then he thinks some more, and his narration continues. And I remember Frankie Thompson, still calmly chatting as he dipped towards the hill with his engine seizing up, much too low to jump for it. What bastard luck, huh, Jamie? Look after my dog! Christ almighty, I can't die! And then a smile creeps onto his face, and he thinks, Who will take care of poor old Tigger? Who I guess is the name of Frankie Thompson's dog that he promised he would take care of. So the plane flies on a bit more, and we see he actually does reach the Thames River, and his narration continues. Two minutes later, and the Thames is snaking away, like a tempting dancing angel. And I know I'm not going to make it. I tell myself, no, they built these things tough, you'll be fine. But the engine's spitting out its death rattle, and the ailerons hanging by a thread. And we see Jamie hearing all this, and he's saying, no, no! But he hardens himself once again, and his narration continues saying, don't surrender, don't give in, to the last drop. And then his engine dies and the propellers stop moving. And then we see the tips of his wings begin to crumble. And his narration says, and then she's a glider, then a stone. And as his plane begins to nosedive, it looks like it's going to head straight onto a grassy bank next to the Thames. And he's pulling back on the yoke as hard as he can saying, don't give in to the last bloody drop. And then his plane crashes nose first into the ground and explodes. Then we cut back to John Constantine, who's still laying on the grass right next to that skeleton. And he's having flashes of this dream or memory of the plane exploding. And then the guy inside yelling and screaming as he's on fire, trying to get out of the plane cockpit. And Jamie actually does get out and he's able to crawl just a little bit away from the plane. And as John dreams about this horrific scene, he's unconsciously saying, ah, ah, ah as he dreams about, I'm assuming, burning to death, or at least watching someone burn to death. Then he wakes up in a fright, and he turns his head slightly, and he sees the skull of Jamie Kilmartin staring back at him. And he thought he was just having a bad dream. He didn't know there was actually like a dead person next to him. So he screams out, ah! And then almost as if the skeleton had moved in between the time he was sleeping and woke up, the skeleton has like an arm on his arm, almost like it reanimated or something during the dream. And when John sees the skeleton hand on his arm, he says, Ah, Jesus! Friggin' bloody Jesus, get off! And then he sits up and tries to get away from it, saying, Jesus! <laughs> Jesus! But then he calms down and realizes there's nothing going on, and <laughs> he looks at Jamie's skeleton, and he begins to wonder if that dream was real. So he walks a couple feet above the skeleton, and he begins to pull up some grass that looks like it's raised, and as he does, he slowly uncovers the body of a crashed airplane. And then he looks back at the skeleton, knowing now that that was a true story, and this was the last memory of Jamie Kilmartin, who died during World War II. And then he looks up at London across the river, and as we turn the page, we see he has actually gone to London, and I'm not sure if I mentioned it before, but that was all at night or maybe early morning that he was drunk and laying on the bank of the Thames. So now it's daytime, and he's in the city, and he's watching people walk by, and he sees a guy that looks like he's got some money because he's wearing a nice suit, and hat and he's an older gentleman and as he walks by john he glances at him and gives a look of disdain like oh i hate these homeless people but john just looks back with a nice smile on his face and all of a sudden the man stops and he says to john uh pardon me but uh i've just had the strangest urge and what happened here was john used some magic 
He got this guy to stop. And we see as the man says this, he's reaching into his jacket as if to grab for his pocketbook. And the man continues saying, Here we are, my checkbook and wallet. There should be at least 50 or 60 pounds in there. The cash card's there too. The number is 4729. And John reaches out and takes all that stuff from him and he says, Cheers. And then the man continues, Oh, how remiss of me. You'll need to sign the checks and they won't accept your signature. And with a big shit eating grin on John's face, he looks at the man and says, It's all right, mate. I'm sure I'll have no trouble forging yours. And the man says to John, That's a relief. Well, how splendid. Best of luck then. And then he proceeds to walk away from John as John says, You too. And then as we turn the page, we see John has used that money to get a hotel room and bought some clean clothes. So we see he's got hanging on the door of the restroom his usual suit and tie with trench coat. We see John through the restroom door leaning on the sink and he's looking at himself in the mirror as he feels his shaven face because he's taken a shower and he's cleaned himself up a bit. But he still has the long hair, but it's nice and combed now. Then we turn the page again and John is dressed now in his suit and trench coat and he's back where he found that skeleton and he's brought a shovel and he's dug a hole. And his narration says, All my life, one way or another, I always thought I had it all worked out. Even how to die. To give up and pull the great black blanket around me. Finally admitting, yeah, it's too much. I can't win. I quit. And then I was tangled in the wreckage of a war fought 50 years ago, dreaming a dead man's final moments that were blowing on the breeze of history. And I knew I was wrong. So now, I'm finished with the past, and it's finished teaching me my history lesson. I bury it again which is another lesson I learned a long time ago. Then we see him beginning to cover the grave of the skeleton who is in the hole that he's dug. And as he fills it with dirt, he looks at the skeleton and thinks, what were you like? Were you an arsehole who fought with for the empire on your lips or a stupid kid who didn't think at all? Did you want a better world for the children that you'd have and try to carve it out with fire and iron? And then he thinks about that for a second and says, whatever, you never gave up. You knew the precious thing you had, and you scraped and clawed and fought to the last drop of blood for life. And I think I owe you something, mate. Then we cut to John having finished burying the bones of Jamie Kilmartin, and as he lights a cigarette, he says, So the wind blows till my sweat dries cold against me, and I turn my back on the city I've crawled around for six long months. Been gone a long time. Lot to do. And as he walks away from the burial site, he thinks, There's always somewhere lower you can go. But if you do, why do you even bother in the first place? Then we cut away from John back to, I assume, heaven, or at least the heaven of Jamie Kilmartin, because we see his plane flying high, and he's doing barrel rolls and a bunch of different kind of aerial tricks. And as he does this, the narration says, And he rolled her clear across the patchwork fields of England, and he opened the throttle and pulled back the stick, and he laughed with joy until the sunlight sparkled on his tears. And the hurricane leapt towards the sun. And we see his plane pull up and fly directly towards the sun that is just peeking out through the clouds. And this is actually a big splash page image. And we see the name of this issue, which they didn't say at the beginning, is called Finest Hour. And that, my friends, is the end of the issue. So some very exciting stuff. We see John is back in action. He has decided he doesn't want to die. And he has become reinvigorated. And he's going to fight death with all he has now. So if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And we will see you on the next one.